Good evening to all who have joined online to the webinar organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I'm Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. We are in the process in commencing a webinar organized to commemorate the World Environment Day, which fell on yesterday. As we all know, the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association is like a massive tree that's with so many branches. Out of all branches, the most youngest, the most recently developed branch of the Sri Lanka Medical Association is the SLMA Young Members Forum. So this particular webinar that we organize to mark the World Environment Day is organized by the Sri Lanka uh, SLMA Young Members Forum to, uh, to establish the enormous environment disaster that happened in the recent past, or in, I mean, a few weeks ago, here in Sri Lankan waters by the MV Express uh, Pearl, the, uh, the ship disaster, the fire and the disaster which caused an unprecedented level of environmental pollution. Uh, this is recognized as the worst ever, the environmental disaster that happened in the recent history of Sri Lanka. So as a responsible organization, we, uh, the Sri Lanka Medical Association appreciate the environmental hazards and its impact for health of the people here. So that based on that knowledge, we, uh, the Sri Lanka Medical, the, the Young Forum, Young Members Forum of the Sri Lanka, members, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, was motivated to have this webinar today. So I'm very thankful to the members of the SLMA Young Members Forum for organizing this. I mean, this is their very first, the inaugural activity. So I congratulate the members of the Young Members Forum for organizing this webinar on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. So with uh, that brief introduction, we, they have lined up very three eminent speakers to address the uh, extent of the environmental pollution caused by this uh, disaster. So to introduce these speakers and to continue with the webinar, let me invite the two uh, very uh, active two members of the Young Members Forum, uh, Dr. Sankar, Sankar Randini Kumar and Dr. Sajit Idrisingha. Over to Sankar and Ranj, uh, Sajit, please. Thank you very much, Madam. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another public webinar of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. And uh, this is actually organized and conducted by the Young Members Forum of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. This time, we are organizing this webinar to commemorate the World Environment Day, which fell on 5th of June, that's yesterday. And this time, the theme of the World Environment Day is ecosystem restoration. Our topic today is the talk of the town these days, the marine disaster caused by the fire at the MV Express Pearl ship. And our topic is on impact on environment and health. We have three eminent speakers with us. Mr. Ashoka Virakon, Professor Sewan Dijayakodi, and Professor Enrique Barros from Brazil. Uh, Sajid? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sankar. So, in order to start this webinar, I would like to call upon Mr. Ashoka Virakon, who is a scientist at uh, NARA, National Aquatic Research Development and uh, aquatic agencies, NARA. And uh, in order to start uh, this webinar, uh, I just want to ask from uh, Asok, uh, could you please give us an overview uh, about this express pearl incident and what has happened to the marine life, the corals, the beach, and the other 
uh, aquatic life uh, related to this uh, matter uh, for a for us to get a basic idea uh, and a uh, approach to this webinar over to you, uh, mr ashok yeah ashok you can go ahead yes uh, on the video uh, i'll introduce myself first i'm ashok Virakon from nara working in the division of uh, oceanography marine sciences uh, I work uh, in kind of an uh, interdisciplinary uh, manner. And uh, before I giving a speech on uh, uh, what has happened uh, with the uh, collapsed ship, let me give a kind of idea of uh, the uh, plastic problem that we have in Sri Lanka. So uh, uh, Sri Lanka is an island nation and uh, we have uh, gigantic use uh, in uh, plastic products. And uh, let me uh, give you about information about the capita use of uh, plastics. Um, uh, the per capita use of plastics uh, is uh, 0.1. Uh, kilo per week uh, counts up to uh, 5.72 kilograms per year and uh, uh, the most widely used category among all of the kinds of plastic that we use is uh, are the uh, single use plastics and the highest use of plastics were recorded uh, is recorded from uh, western and eastern provinces uh, unfortunately, 60 of our people uh, burn plastics and uh, that has triggered plastic pollution uh, in our country. So uh, look at the current disposal system. Now, uh, this is uh, what is happening currently in Sri Lanka. So the problem is that uh, the vast majority of uh, solid waste has been uh, uh, discarded in the absence of sufficient infrastructure or uh, collection and recycling facilities. So uh, this is the reason why plastic litter is getting accumulated all over the country. And because of that, this is what we see today. So, we see that the animals, wild animals, a lot of wild animals are troubled and the nature is disturbed. And this is one of the dumbest decisions that our country has ever made. Um, look at the waste disposal uh, places. So I'll give one example. Some of the dumping sites uh, in the central hills are very closely uh, located uh, to the water bodies. Uh, one example is the dumping site that located in Patugastar. So this site is in very close proximity to the Mahavali River, which means that the disposed waste can easily reach the river and the waste can disperse easily. So what is the problem we have here is that the, the, in these areas, the river is uh, flowing very slowly. The slope is very low. So uh, the, the uh, debris or the waste can be easily moved. And the uh, disturbing uh, issue is that in most of uh, the cases, the users of the uh, rivers or the water bodies are in very close proximity to these dumping sites. And even in the Katugasta uh, open dumping site, the uh, water uh, intake point for the distribution is just a few hundred uh, meters uh, away from the dumping site. So uh, uh, this 
is a reason why uh, solid waste is getting uh, leached to the water bodies we have. So this is what we don't see. Usually we see the, the large plastic matter in uh, places like uh, beaches or uh, on the road, but what we don't see are the tiniest particles. Those are called microplastics. The particles that can be broken down from larger plastics or the particles that are used to produce uh, plastic products like uh, some kind of cosmetics, cleaning products, and the, the smaller particles that are uh, leads to the uh, water bodies uh, when those waste are not uh, properly managed. These waste can be easily uh, taken away by uh, water canals uh, if they are not uh, properly treated. So we have uh, findings. Uh, some of the latest uh, research findings from the research uh, that we have done at NARA since 2016 is uh, shown here. So what we have to conclude from this is that the microplastics are everywhere and uh, even the ocean, even the uh, uh, air that we breathe, even the water we drink has have got uh, contaminated. So uh, through the, some of these research findings, uh, we can conclude that the uh, ocean uh, or the marine microplastics are not uh, uh, in great quantities that, as we think, but uh, if you if we uh, if you look at the uh, uh, statistics now the beach sand uh, have got contaminated uh, in large uh, quantities large number of uh, uh, plastics it uh, goes up to uh, 233000 uh, number of particles per uh, cubic meter so uh, in the open uh, ocean, the number of particles, or the uh, level of contamination is uh, quite low, but uh, when it comes to beach sand or, or the waters uh, that, that are uh, closer to the uh, coastline uh, are uh, contaminated. And uh, usually uh, we find more plastics in the west coast compared to the East Coast. Uh, this is some interesting that we uh, have to think about the connectivity in the ocean. We are not alone and uh, we are interconnected uh, with uh, many countries, uh, in fact, continents uh, through uh, the ocean, specifically through the active ocean color that we have around. Uh, the island. So as a result, transboundary pollution is very significant in Sri Lanka. Uh, particles, both large and small, can be brought from both Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal from different countries. So we, we could be able to identify the different origins. And uh, what we see uh, seasonal variation in uh, the contamination uh, in uh, coastlines where uh, during uh, pe the period like the uh, southwest monsoon, the uh, western and the northwestern province uh, coastline uh, are getting more polluted. Uh, with uh, the large number of uh, particles uh, getting stranded. So we can see uh, different uh, uh, plastics and uh, polythene uh, belong to different uh, categories, can be uh, medical waste, 
and uh, single use plastics uh, and different uh, wrapping ma materials so many many categories but, uh, but uh, most of them belong to the secondary category of uh, plastics oh. and finally we have the express pearl incident we have a sinking ship around us so what happened here uh, we had a ship moving around uh, the country coming towards the port and it, the ship uh, collapsed while reaching Colombo, having uh, loads of uh, chemicals and microplastics uh, we called uh, pellets and uh, those have uh, reached uh, to the, the, the ocean uh, after the ship has been collapsed. Uh, as I said below, uh, as I said before, now have a look at uh, the movement of uh, particles uh, due to the ocean uh, currents and the near shore uh, currents uh, that we have already mentioned. Now in the uh, image shown in the left, you can see the nodal point where the near shore car currents uh, divide into north and the south, where the red dot shows the, the location uh, of the uh, accident, where the ship has collapsed. So the particles can be taken uh, upwards, uh, northwards uh, to the coastlines from uh, Nigambo to uh, uh, Chilo and uh, the, the particles dropped off the ship uh, below the nodal point uh, can be taken uh, by the currents that are moving southwards uh, towards the southern coast and the current, currents can take away the plastic uh, material or the chemicals or whatever the debris or pollutants that have dissolved or suspended uh, away from the coast by coastal currents uh, and importantly can also be brought back uh, by ocean currents uh, to our uh, coastal line. Uh, what is important here is that ocean currents can take particles not from country to country through the ocean but from continent to another. So uh, these particles can reach a country in the Bay of Bengal one day and can be brought back as well. So that is how the ocean has a vector uh, of uh, marine debris or uh, uh, particles uh, dissolved or uh, suspended. So let's have a look at the impact on uh, the environment and health. So the burning ship can uh, give a rise to uh, air pollutants uh, and uh, there were chemicals, both uh, acids and bases, uh, caustic soda and uh, uh, nitric acid. And the debris are uh, plastic pellets, which we use to produce uh, most of the pl uh, plastic uh, products and categorized as primary uh, plastics. So uh, the other kind of debris are the metal, wood and plastic that are burned down and broken, burned or broken down uh, due to the uh, accident, uh, due to the ca caching of fire. And uh, due to chemical reactions or fire, uh, the ocean environment closer to the place where the uh, ship uh, caught fire can get warmed. So the heat or the warm water can also uh, damages to the ocean as a uh, pollutant. So <laughs> just have a look of the uh, classification of these chemicals by uh, IMO. Uh, two of 
of the chemicals uh, uh, dropped off the ship, fallen off the ship uh, to the sea are uh, the most hazardous. We call the noxious uh, substances. And uh, uh, just look at the behavior of those uh, substances. Those move, move down and dissolve. Uh, and uh, they will have uh, exothermic reaction with uh, water uh, that will cause uh, the rise of uh, rise in temperature, and uh, the, this will also cause uh, fumes. Have a look at the uh, chemicals, especially the chemicals that we have uh, in uh, plastic pellets. Now we need to conduct a proper analysis, uh, but this is, these are from the previous findings. Uh, we have collected a very few number of uh, pellets from our coastline. Uh, the Sri Lankan coastline uh, was not that polluted with uh, pellets. Most of the uh, uh, microplastics were secondary microplastics. But uh, from the very few uh, pellets, now we got to know there were uh, different chemicals that will have uh, uh, lethal impacts on the marine ecosystem and finally on human health as well. So uh, one of the uh, uh, chemicals uh, is, um, this, uh, we call that uh, PCBs. And um, so this will have <coughs> any uh, categories. Uh, based on their uh, active component. And uh, uh, depending on the category, they will have uh, different uh, uh, reactions and different uh, impacts on uh, animal tissues. So uh, um, most of the uh, PBAs, uh, sorry, PCBs are defined as uh, definite carcinogen definite carcinogens, which, uh, def which can uh, cause cancer. So some of the toxic effects uh, they have are uh, endocrine uh, disruption. Uh, and they, they, these PCBs cause the blocking of uh, thyroid function and cause neurotoxicity. And the other category, is uh, the DDEs, uh, which is the uh, uh, David uh, DDT. DDE, actually, uh, this is very uh, toxic. And uh, if it's uh, more than uh, 79 uh, milligrams per kilo, so this will be uh, very uh, poisonous. And this, these levels, uh, have been proved by uh, laboratory experiments uh, done uh, on uh, mice. And uh, these DDEs are also uh, endocrine uh, disruptors. Uh, those cause damage to the reproductive system. The all chemicals together uh, can be disastrous and can have effect on the reproductive system of animals, uh, on the uh, neurons on the brain, uh, organs like liver, uh, they can uh, affect uh, hormones, so, uh, different kind of uh, uh, damages into the internal tissues of animal uh, can occur uh, if an uh, animal is uh, exposed to these chemicals. So, uh, Another one, another important thing to consider is that these chemicals can be bioaccumulated, meaning that they can be uh, accumulated along the food chain, along the food web, and goes up to the top levels, where the topmost species uh, can, will not be able to tolerate the levels and they die. So uh, most of the uh, um, uh, inactive or the species that 
uh, lacks uh, metabolism uh, can have can be affected as well. Uh, you know what? The, some of these chemicals uh, can be taken down along the water column, and with the water pressure increasing, with the depth, these chemicals can be uh, taken to the bottom levels. So uh, the the animals there or the marine organisms there uh, can be endangered. So so. These are some of the uh, harmful effects uh, that can be caused by chemicals included uh, in uh, uh, microplastics or the pellets that uh, we usually uh, find. But uh, to uh, make it sure, we have to conduct more analysis on uh, what, what are the chemical categories, what are the exact categories of chemicals and uh, how they have been uh, uh, dissolved or dispersed in water and taken away from place to place uh, must uh, definitely be studied in order to make a good decision uh, on the vulnerable species and the area affected. So the next program, is the oil that can be spilled uh, as the ship is sinking. Unfortunately, uh, we are a bit lack uh, of uh, technology. Different countries uh, use uh, different uh, effective methods to uh, collect, separate, uh, oil uh, and some of these methods can be easily adapted, uh, but uh, usually uh, this is kind of early action uh, we should take in case of an oil spill. So uh, depend on the uh, nature of the oil uh, content, so we can decide what uh, technology must be adapted. Uh, this is different from liquids uh, to sol and solids. So in the liquid phase, there are kind of uh, uh, separation methods that we can use easily, uh, treating them first and then collecting. And so, uh, I will give some kind of a basic idea about oil skimmers and booms. Uh, these are some technologies that we can use even in the future. Now, I have seen uh, many authorities uh, have uh, tried this uh, up to some extent, but uh, we need more. Uh, there are two uh, kind of devices called oil skimmers and oil booms. So they can collect uh, or send, uh, oil uh, contaminants from the ocean and uh, separate from water. So uh, different kind of technology has uh, uh, both disadvantages and advantages, but uh, these methods can be adapted uh, in, uh, uh, the, because uh, now um, there are methods that can then we, we can uh, use in the op open sea and in the coastal waters. Now we can use, there are methods uh, to use oil skimmers and booms as a mooring system. So uh, we, the, the system can be fixed to the bottom while the sur surface floating, the floats can stop spreading of oil uh, while the, the oil skimmer uh, can collect the oil to a centralized system. So uh, uh, techniques can be customized with our technology. So in the future, this is how uh, we should cope with such an incident. So that's all for today. Thank you very much, Ashok. Thank you, Ashok.
It was a very fantastic uh, information that you are, that you gave us. Very, very valuable information. So I would like to uh, hand over to Sankar uh, to you. continue the session. Thank you uh, very much. Ashok, uh, please uh, stay with us because there are some questions coming up at the end of yeah, the sure. session. Thank you. Sankar. Thank you, Sajid. Thank you, Sajid. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Sevuandi Jayakodi. Professor Sevuandi Jayakodi earned her BSc honors in zoology from University of Kalania and postgraduate diploma in wildlife management and conservation from Wildlife Institute India and her PhD from University of Aberdeen, UK. She served in the Department of Wildlife Conservation as an assistant director, and currently she is a professor in Department of Aquaculture and Fisheries, Faculty of Livestock, Fisheries and Nutrition of Wyamba University of Sri Lanka. Her research interests include coastal ecosystem management and policy and impacts of the human disturbances on ecosystems, processes and functions. And this makes her one of the best persons to talk about this is disaster. Or to Professor Sewandi to talk about the disturbance to marine life, flora, fauna, and the future. Thank you very much, Sankar. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, let me start sharing some my slides. So uh, what I uh, want to cover today Part of the content that I wanted to cover is already being covered, so my life is very easy. Therefore, I can skip certain slides, or rather I can rush through some of the slides. Um, what I really wanted to emphasize today is um, Sri Lanka as a country, when it comes to a disaster of this nature, where we are and how we are dealing with it, in terms of our administration and also the policy side. And in, uh, in towards the latter part, I, I wanted to go towards uh, thinking beyond the disaster and why it matters. So let me take you through some of the information that I compiled for you today. Um, uh, this is just to give you an idea why this matters. Number one, to say that 40% of the people in this country lives along the coastal belt. So everything that happens along the coastal belt of Sri Lanka matters a lot. But at the same time, what is also important to remember is, if, as you can see from the marine traffic uh, website, we are, a, we are a marine hub. Sri Lanka receives on a daily basis, large number of vessels touching upon our ports along the country. So as a result, we do have uh, a need to make sure that we are prepared for any types of disaster. So with that in my mind, I just also want to tell you that when it comes to the land or our, the land that we really own, we have to think beyond our terrestrial land to the uh, coastal areas or to the rather to the uh, marine areas because our EEZ, exclusive economic zone of Sri Lanka, is 7.8 times the la land area. So we, we own a large oceanic area, therefore we really need to look at our preparedness in terms of managing our marine wealth. So with that, I think this was touched upon, therefore I'm not going to talk about it because why I really wanted to talk about this now before I come to the uh, shipwreck uh, related uh, discussion is to tell you that the, the, the problem with the waste and litter is, uh, has, is, has been there for a long time now and we have not been dealing with it properly or rather very efficiently. And this is why when we want to be on the top for good things, unfortunately, we also end up being on the top for bad things. So we are the fifth among the top 20 countries that contribute to marine pollution in the world, which is not a good thing. So under this background, last year, actually, last year, we, I was a part of a group that was doing a port waste audit 
on behalf of Commonwealth. All the Commonwealth countries are undertaking that. So the report was submitted in March 2021. And therefore, I have some information which is just released so that, uh, and they are going to be very important for today's discussion. During that study, we looked at how we, as a country, we manage waste, because looking at the administrative structure and the policy base is quite important to understand whether we are efficient in doing something. Now, you can see I, uh, the, in, in the graph, I've shown four columns, who's responsible for policy formulation, who's responsible for implementation at both the national and the local authority level, and who's actually responsible for monitoring and reporting and also for international coordination because all these four things matter. And as the as the slide itself self speaks, you can see that a large number of agencies are there. Both at the ministerial level to the local authority level and to the provincial level, we have a governance structure that is bound to deal with waste. And when you look at the next slide, this is again an outcome from that particular study. You can see that the agencies are interlinked in terms of their responsibilities, communication, so on and so forth. As there are a lot of medical doctors, you can see Ministry of Health itself is a part of the whole, prop, uh, whole administrative structure. So in, in, from one side, yes, administratively, we are in a good position. Later, when I start going towards the latter part of my presentation, I would question, not just for myself, but also for you, is this the ideal situation, having several institutions, but where are we going wrong? It's a question that I would uh, impose on you as well as something that I'm trying to answer myself. Okay, so from here, I also want to share with you this slide because it's also important. Certainly when it comes to transboundaries issues, uh, handling mar uh, uh, maritime affairs is always transboundary. International commitments are very, very important. I've just indicated here some of the key international commitments government of Sri Lanka has made for in relation to waste management. This exclusively, there is some provision under these things for us to manage marine waste. So from Basel Convention to the most important MARPOL regulations. Uh, now, when you look at the MARPOL regulations, underneath I have shown few annexures, annexure one to annexure six. What these annexures are, as you can see, they are the regulations for different types of waste. So the study that was conducted um, last year, what we really did was following a standard format that has been prepared for all the countries, Commonwealth countries, we assessed the preparedness of Sri Lanka in terms of port waste. We looked at main ports, Trincomalee, Colombo, Hambantota. We looked at fishing ports, Kalpitiya, Wala, Chenedi, Kurta, and Puranavela. We also looked at naval ports. Because of COVID, we couldn't visit to Trinco, but Kankasanthure, Kalpitiya, and Gaul. We visited all these ports in order to see how are we handling waste and our compliance to MAPOL schedule wastes? In addition to that, for our personal, because of our personal interest, we went beyond that and we visited 19 land insights. As you can see in the map, it was a jolly good time for us traveling around the country, looking at all these land insights and the nearest adjacent beach in order to see what's the situation of land insights. For those who uh, are not familiar with the word land insights, these are the places where ordinary day-to-day -day fishermen bring their catch. So these are basically places where fishermen land their uh, vessels and uh, sort out their fish and subsequently sell. So we wanted to look at the 
handling of waste in these places also. I am not going to go into details, but I'm just going to show you the outcome. I'm sure you knew the conclusions that we brought for main ports. Uh, as you can see in terms of the main ports, the three ports are here and I have indicated the uh, types of waste from oil waste, oil waste to the waste management plan. You can see when it comes to noxious liquid substances, Ashok was talking about them a little while ago because this, in this particular case, it's noxious liquid substances that created one of the problems. You see that the last port waste audit indicated none of our ports were ready to receive noxious liquid substances. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean we cannot handle it because most of the time these noxious liquid substances would be coming with the vessel as cargo, not necessarily that they will become waste, they will be unloaded in Sri Lanka, they will be touching Sri Lankan ports, will be leaving. However, when you are a marine hub, the potential that one day some facility to handle noxious liquid substances somewhere in the country would arise cannot be ruled out. And then I think that is something that we see at the moment. At the same time, we looked at whether we have properly documented waste management plans. I must make a correction. Colombo has a satisfactory one. Um, we later, on, later on, we received it. But uh, uh, apart from Hambantota and Colombo, uh, there were no properly documented waste management plans. So that's another highlight I just wanted to tell you. And from there, I'm going into the fishing ports. You can see uh, then the situation becomes a little bit bad or oh, I would say, but becomes worse because, um, well, there's no mandatory for uh, fishing ports to follow MARPOL, but then you can see certain ports, like in the case of Decovita, you can see how uh, this uh, port is now sort of trying their level best to comply with uh, garbage management and oil waste management, which was very interesting to see. And we were very pleased to see Walachini Fishery Harbor having a waste management plan. So this was a stock account, taking a stock assessment of our preparedness and coming to naval ports. They, it, it was a different story because either because they are duty bound, either because of their discipline, or either because we always see Navy as an organization that always uh, try to do th things very properly and also environmental conscious, you can see in terms of oil, waste, sewage, and garbage, they had all, they fully met the requirements of Commonwealth. It was, uh, it was something we were very pleased to see. They didn't have waste management plans, but of course, every, all the responsibilities were assigned to uh, different officers through their terms of reference. Okay, right. So every time when we see a big disaster like the one that we talk about now happens, we become very sentimental. We, we talk a lot. Uh, social media is full of things to read, some very authentic, some are with some are sort of like hypothetical and uh, made up stories. But have we really been treating our ocean, our coastline properly? In addition to looking at the situation of the ports, we also, as I told you, we looked at the situation in beaches and the land insides. Here's some outcome, I think that will be of interest for our today's discussion. Here's a tally count of different waste types that we saw. Uh, you can see the port, uh, land insight. Uh, in the x, x axis and in the y axis, the tally count. And you can see everywhere we went, plastic is the most common pollutant that we saw. As plastic is uh, basically uh, drowning the other things, which you cannot see, the moment I remove plastic, then you see the other things. Now you see 
we are an interesting nation. In addition to plastic, we tend to be throwing away so many other things. Very interestingly, when I was comparing our data with the rest of the Commonwealth, something that came out was textile. We, are, we have too many clothes, either must be one reason, otherwise there cannot be any other reason to see this much of textile washing ashore as waste. So that's, that's something I wanted to show you. And when here's some information about the percentage of each waste category in land insights, and you can, you can see very clearly plastic uh, accounts for most of the waste. And plus, in, because this was done very recently, you can see the amount of uh, face masks. Sanitary was very much to do with the face masks and how it is now uh, becoming a significant waste material in our shoreline. So the take home message I want to give uh, with this introduction is that Yesterday also I made the same remark because we talk a lot about restoration. We are not a nation that have been really treating our ocean very well. Ashoka had the same sentiments and I'm reiterating it. Now let's get into the real uh, uh, reason why we all talk about this today. The uh, Express Pearls, um, uh, shipwreck. What is important is from a policy point of view, I'm just again showing you the uh, de uh, de 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 details from uh, marine traffic. Now this gives us certain hints. You can see where the ship had been and on which days and also the time in port. So you can see very well that uh, um, if you look at UAE, it had been there for one day. But after that, once it comes to Hazira, India, it has been there for less, or less than nine hours. Okay. Uh, with that, we, we one can ask the question why that ship left the uh, port so quickly? What were the things behind it? These are the questions that we need to ask from a policy point of view, administrative point of view, because Indian Ocean, especially the countries around India, Indian Ocean have so many agreements and good practices. So one, one, one very good question that we need to ask is, were there telltale stories about the status of the vessel? Did we get the right communication on the right time about this particular vessel? It's nothing, uh, those are the things that later on we need to look at from a policy point of view, to make sure that we learn from this disaster, because this is not the first, and this is not, certainly not going to be the last. But how are we going to move forward as a nation and think about these dis disasters is something that we need to look at. Okay, so I'm just showing those places where it had been and where the situ where the disaster stuck, all coming from marine traffic, uh, there are satellite images. And about one hour ago in Sri Lanka, real maritime traffic in the country at the moment, you can see where the vessel is. And also to tell you, one disaster is not going to stop marine traffic entering and exiting the country. That's exactly why we need to be prepared, right? Uh, Ashoka touched this information, IMDG uh, codes, uh, International Maritime Dangerous Goods codes, because every time when the manifest comes, we are from the customs to harbor master, there is a procedure to follow, and especially IMDG code is a very important thing because you need to ensure that you know what is in it and where they are headed to. Are, will they be uh, sort of like, are they? cargo to be downloaded here, all that information has to be scrutinized. And under that, uh, you can also see the classification over here. So that they, these are all in place. What I want to tell you is globally, every documentation, everything that has to be done, and in Sri Lanka also, the procedure to be followed is in place. It's documented at least. Human error is something else, but it's documented. I'm showing you some information from the manifest itself. 
I have uh, sort of separated what comes as the dangerous good category. Uh, the, I think this is certainly going to be uh, important for the ne next speaker, basically because, and also for us from a conservation point of view, and you can see that most of it in the uh, DG dangerous goods, goods category, most of it seems to be metals. And then in addition to that, you can also see the amount of caustic soda, uh, the flakes that were there, and uh, the uh, set of like the types that they were in. So this is another thing that uh, the Ashok was talking about. I'm just uh, rephrasing. And then in addition to that, of course, there had been nitric acid and methanol, um, so on and so forth. But for me, there's another thing that is of interest, that is the dust urea, because when you look at uh, and uh, look at the disaster of this nature, it's not just the noxious liquid substances, but from the uh, oceanography point of view, things like dust urea are important because they are possibly nutrients. The sudden intake, upload, sudden release of loads of dust nutria to a certain area can have very important sequences. It can trigger different um, uh, nutrient levels accordingly. The phytoplankton, zooplankton, and ichthyophora are going to be affected. So the changes to the food food webs then can have. Uh, ultimate changes to the entire food chain. So that those are the long-term things that we have to envisage. And to understand all that, you have to look at what has been there and what are the likely reactions that can happen once, once they enter into the ocean. Another important thing again is the HDPE that uh, we all know, the nurdles that are now washing ashore. Um, Coming to the nurdles, of course, I, uh, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but certainly these nurdles, uh, we already know certain countries already faced this thing. Hong Kong had a similar incident. They faced it, but there were lots of lessons that were learned. And here, here we are now trying to handle the situation. Beyond the disaster, if we look at it, we are talking about an area where we have some of the prime seagrass beds. Seagrass beds are the recruitment grounds for most of ichthyophona. And therefore, not just the nurdles, but other chemicals, they are potential dilution, subsequent entry, and absorption, adsorption, and uh, bioaccumulation are going to be some important questions we have to answer. Coming to sea grasses, though the disaster happened few, several miles away, we have to remember sea grasses are very sensitive species. And I have given you the types of sea grasses that we see in the country. And you can also see that some of them are in the uh, threatened category. As you can see here, uh, Halophila becari, it's a vulnerable species, therefore any impact to these sea grasses are something that we need to monitor for. Here's Nigamba Lagoon and you can see uh, where the sea grass beds are found. And what, something that is very important to see in future is to continually, continuously conduct studies to see the subsequent impacts from uh, these chemical components. Uh, beyond uh, Sea grasses, then we also have the mangroves. This is the uh, latest map compiled by the Minister of Environment in terms of mangrove distribution. You see the area. So here also, this, where you see these colors, these are where the mangroves are found. It's a very patchy distribution. So every mangrove patch is important. And certainly the mangrove patch in Nigambo is very important because fisheries activities related to Nigambo area is partly because of the presence of mangroves. And here's a photograph that uh, comes from Nigambo Lagoon itself. You can see already uh, the dispersion of nurdles. Now, unlike in the coastal areas, mangroves are a different system. Here, the problem is the sediments. 
And these sediments, because with every high tide and low tide, sediments churn and uh, sort of uh, move uh, in the uh, sort of lagoon flow, estuarine flow, and then these snurdles can stay for a long, long time accumulated with uh, lagoon sediments. So that's the danger that we are having. So what we see already is nurdles to stay within the coastline, therefore composition of the real composition of the nurdles, but also potential substances that can release polyaromatic hydrocarbons are things that we need to study. Of course, we know that several metal containers have been there, so the potential impacts of release of heavy metals and then subsequent entry of these heavy metals into food chains are also important. I was talking about nutrient uh, urea, no, urea being a nutrient, its impact to the food cycles got to be studied too. I know that several doctors are listening today and this is one reason why I posted this photograph. Here's a turtle that was washed ashore was the show dead and at the moment I, I've been talking to many people many experts to find out because this is something certainly new for us to see this animal being bleached like this what kind of a chemical or what uh, what concoction of chemical can create a situation like this is something we really would like to know um, if there's any medical doctor that can be give us a, a possible answer, I'm, I'm more than happy. That's one reason why I'm showing it. But we have to uh, get ready for uh, new questions, new studies, uh, possibly information that we have to share with the rest of the world, because this is something new for the entire world. And with that, I also want to take this time and take this opportunity to tell you Wildlife and Nature Protection Society is at the moment doing a voluntary nurdle count. If you happen to be living near to the coast, if your backyard is the sea, please support them. Just take an ice cream lid, two liter or a four liter. Press it to the places where you see nurdles. There's a questionnaire, it's online. They have already uh, sort of shared it with many. Uh, in social media as well as with other agencies, please share the data. All you have to do is send a photo of this nature because uh, Ministry of Environment and also the NARA, uh, Wildlife and Nature Protection Society, Forest Department and Wildlife Department, we are trying to look at the, we are trying to ground through the presence of nurdles in order to model the future consequences. So, what are the dialogues that are required from this thing? Certainly, we need to learn from the previous disasters. For it, sorry for the spelling mistake here. We need to look at our communication. Are we re really, really doing the right communication? There, I would like to raise the question how medical fraternity can uh, sort of come forward to come up with right communication in a situation like this. We certainly need to handle the mental health. Uh, there are lots of people that are mentally affected in a situation like this. Do we have a helpline? Do we have a hotline that someone can speak to? And of course, long-term research and restoration ideas. These are the things that needs to get into mainstream dialogue, both among the um, research agencies, government agencies, and also with the public. So. With that, I want to thank everyone for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sewandi, uh, for that great speech. Uh, I especially appreciate the last part. Uh, you thinking about the, the large picture, especially the hazards and even the mental health of the people. So thank you very much for coming in. Uh, our next speaker is, here, is a family that practices in a rural town in mountains in southern Brazil, which is named as Santa Maria do Havel. Enrique also serves as a professor at 
University of Cassius du Sud, Brazil. He's the chair, the current chair of the Wonka Working Party of the Environment in 2016 and actively involved in planetary health. On personal note, I got to know Enrique in year 2016 in Brazil, and since then we are good friends. Enrique is not a stranger to the, the SLMA as well, because he visited Sri Lanka to attend our International Medical Congress in year 2018 as a guest speaker. Enrique, over to you to enlighten us about the health hazards and at, at least the main health hazards and uh, also about the planetary health. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I stop sharing my my screen? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I will share. share. Yeah. Share. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association, and especially uh, Sanka, Doctor <clears throat> Sanka who, as he said, is my good friend from, from a few years back. And I'm representing today the Wonka Working Party on the Environment, which uh, represents over 500,000 uh, family doctors. It has presently over 140 members uh, in our email group. And, People here are welcome to join. Just talk to Sanka, send me an email, and we'll uh, invite all of you. Uh, so in 2018, I was invited by the same uh, medical association in Sanka uh, to talk. I, I was actually in Colombo in 2018 to talk about planetary health, uh, which is a topic uh, that is growing very much fast in interest in uh, the medical, international, scientific communities. So what is planetary health? Planetary health is really the impact of the humans and its interconnection with uh, ecosystems and how humans impact the ecosystems and how ecosystems affect human health. And we know that the major causes of health are, of ill health are uh, by uh, social environmental determinants. So this is uh, increasing in uh, importance in the medical uh, world. The human population is indeed healthier than ever. Uh, life, expectancy, life expectancy, poverty and child mortality are all improving for the past 50 years. The problem is that uh, we, in order to reach that, we are producing exponentially more and more pollution. So we say that this pollution is now so impactful in the biosphere that we have reached a new geological epoch. Uh, so in the future, uh, scientists, uh, archeologists will find all this garbage, all this pollution in the sediment from our present uh, civilization. They will be very impressed by the, the amount of trash that we were able to uh, live with or try to live with. Uh, in, the present, uh, in the present years, we know that uh, 9 million people around the world already die prematurely from pollution, all kinds of pollution, uh, at least 9 million. That is almost or a, a bit over the, the, the deaths caused by AIDS, tuberculosis, and uh, malaria, three times that, or 15 times the death rate uh, of uh, all kinds of violence, including wars. But uh, this was by the Lancet Commission on Pollution. 
as the Lancet is very, very careful with that very robust evidence, uh, I hope, yeah, someone is drawing on the, on the board here. Can you see my arrow here? Uh, I hope you can. So the Lancet is very, very concerned with uh, evidence that will be very hard to challenge. So they focused on zone one, which is very well established. We have very good evidence, uh, but it's only at the top of the pyramid. So it's actually uh, the, mo the, the, the most uh, best categorized, uh, categorized uh, uh, death pollution. The problem is here in emerging unquantified health effects of known pollutions. So the nitric acid, the microplastics that can actually be, be found in, in uh, the tissues of the human body, na uh, nanoparticles that can even enter uh, the baby in the womb of the pregnant woman. What are the effects in the health? We actually have not uh, uh, breached uh, robust evidence on that yet. So there's a lot we need to study. And of course, uh, we're accelerating the production of, of uh, many uh, new emerging uh, chemicals that will certainly uh, be causes of, uh, of many problems, uh, including cancer. But we still don't know because uh, science uh, is not uh, presently not concerned enough with the health effects uh, in human health and ecosystems health. To give you one example of what happened here in, in Brazil, a major disaster a few years ago uh, in uh, Minas Gerais, which is in the center of Brazil, uh, a barrage from a mining company Filled with, filled with mud, mainly mud, uh, broke, uh, and it flooded all the way to the ocean. And on the way, it, it killed over 250 people uh, in a little town that was destroyed by this mud. So you can see here the river that uh, was called Sweet River. It actually became the Dead River, filled with mud, killing everything that was alive uh, and harming everyone that was nearby and probably being responsible for, for uh, uh, outbreaks of uh, diseases by vector uh, mosquitoes, like a yellow fever, dengue, because it just disrupted the environment there. So this disaster was so important that the nearby city called Vitória, just over Rio de Janeiro, where Sanka was there and we met, uh, were, they were so shocked that they decided to hold the first Wonka conference on planetary health to, to try to understand, the family doctors need to understand how the environment affects their patients and what they can do about this uh, to help their patients. But today, of course, I'm going to talk about uh, Sri Lanka and especially Colombo, of course. Uh, many of you will know this uh, incredible movie and uh, Arthur C. Clarke that wrote the book on this. He's one of my uh, favorite science fiction writers. And uh, he was a visionary and he lived most of his life in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Maybe some of you will, will even have met him. He passed away in 2008. Eight in Colombo. And despite being a visionary, uh, he probably didn't imagine that such a disaster would happen in his beloved Colombo. I'm saying this because I, I started reading one of his books yesterday and I learned that he lived most of his life in Colombo. So uh, here's the ship, shipwreck that we had a, a beautiful. Uh, uh, speeches on this, uh, on this very tragic accident. But today I'm going to talk about lead, which uh, we have the best evidence. And uh, reading the data on the, on the metals that were spilled from the ship, uh, we, uh, we see that uh, 
much of the heavy metals there were lead. Uh, lead is responsible for over 500,000 deaths a year around the world. And this is a very good estimate because uh, we know a lot about how lead uh, causes short time death and long time death and many health problems. So uh, lead comes from plumbus that comes from uh, that originated plumbing. So the pipes that brings us water. So all the water in, in pipes in, in Rome, in ancient Rome, were done by a plumbing made of lead. And it's even speculated that uh, this lead uh, contaminated the water and may have been responsible for the decline of, uh, uh, of the Roman Empire. So what can lead do? It, it can, as you can see, it can affect uh, most systems in the human body. But today I'm gonna focus in cognitive deficits. So uh, among many sources of uh, contamination, we can see that plumbing is, uh, is a very important one. And as it reacts with water and contaminates water, uh, one of the questions that I would have to the scientists here is, uh, could it contaminate the food chain and affect the fish in, in uh, the long term? And uh, by affecting the fish, could it uh, contaminate uh, larger areas and even people that eat the fish? Well, we need to study that uh, a, bit, uh, uh, a bit better. Uh, this is just an, an a speculation and a long-term preoccupa uh, preoccupation concern. Uh, and to show you how it is important, in the US, they have very good studies that show that very little amounts, nano, nano uh, uh, or micrograms can reduce the IQ of children. Every microgram per deciliter in the blood can uh, reduce IQ enough to reduce 0.5% of earnings in a lifetime. So this is very, very uh, harmful. And because it is so harmful, you can see that uh, the US raised laws to phase out uh, lead and reduce it in, in uh, the blood of uh, their people. The problem with uh, isolating lead, especially in this case, is that traditional thinking is only talks about the direct effect of a, a specific or fragmented part of the reality. So this is not what we have in reality. In reality, we have all these pollutants that uh, uh, the scientists before me uh, raised and how they interact with each other and how they interact with the ecosystem and how that affects human health is very complex. And uh, we probably don't have the scientific methods to understand that. So we need to move from the, uh, from the anatomic model and the very fragmented model uh, of understanding human health to uh, a more complex uh, model that would include the health of the oceans, of the soil, the urban development, economy, and so forth. Uh, in a systemic way, trying to understand the interactions and how it affects the body. So this is a Lancet paper that I recently contributed. We need to understand the anthropogenic uh, causes and how it affects the local socioeconomic, cultural, environmental conditions, uh, the local learning priorities, the global agenda and priorities, and within nature. That is, we're not separate with, uh, from nature. We are part of nature. And whatever affects nature is at the same time affecting us. Uh, we need to 
to understand how, how uh, we're doing harm in social justice, because we can expect that most of the harm will be done in uh, poorer people, more, more vulnerable people, uh, especially around the coast and probably the ones that depend the most on thinking. And finally, we need, we need to do movement building and systems change in order to make sure that our civilization can still continue to uh, offer uh, technical support and, and the help uh, uh, possible from around the world. So the references I brought were from UpToDate, Wikipedia, and The Lancet. Obrigado, Stuti. Let me stop sharing. Thank you very much, Enrique. Muito obrigado. Bohomo yes. Stuti. Uh, so for that uh, very insightful speech. Uh, now, I think we, are, we, we will move on to the Q&A session. Sajid, I would like to invite you to start it. Yeah, thank you, Sanka. So on the chat version, uh, we have received a lot of questions, so I will move one by one. Uh, so this question is directly uh, asked from Mr. Asok. Uh, they're asking whether there is a possibility of moving these uh, contaminants to the eastern coast of Sri Lanka. Mr. Asok. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yeah, 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 so I can hear you. Uh, they're asking whether there is a possibility and estimate of uh, some sort of a duration, uh, whether these uh, particles that are moving south, uh, whether there's a possibility for them to move to the eastern coast. Okay. Now, as you have uh, seen from the simulation, the model that has been developed from uh, by NARA and the University of Western Australia, now the particles, uh, uh, have been moved towards uh, the southern coast. And uh, as you know, uh, there are lots of ocean currents around the country, especially of the southern coast, uh, like the summer monsoon current and the winter monsoon current. Uh, you know that uh, there are two currents uh, uh, adjoining uh, Sri Lankan borders from the uh, Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, uh, which is uh, West Indian coastal current from the uh, Arabian Sea and the East Indian coastal current from the uh, Bay of Bengal. So usually uh, I told you about uh, the uh, uh, transboundary pollution. I mentioned that uh, uh, different uh, marine uh, litter can be stranded on uh, the uh, uh, western coast or the northwestern coast, and that is due to the West Indian coastal current or the uh, uh, summer monsoon current. So uh, now, when it reaches the uh, uh, when the particles can reach this southern coast. Now, these can be uh, taken away at the moment, uh, but you know that these currents change the directions with uh, the season. Now, for example, uh, the southern currents are westward in the northeast monsoon, whereas the currents are uh, eastward uh, during the southwest monsoon. So, uh, so that has uh, different uh, uh, viewpoints and we have to consider those factors and then only we can uh, think about the possibility of uh, movement of these particles towards the uh, Eastern coast. But uh, the Sri Lankan dome and the East Indian uh, coastal current uh, can be good reasons uh, which can take uh, uh, these uh, particles or, or the contaminants uh, towards the east coast or uh, or uh, towards the Bay of Bengal. So that is my idea. Right. Uh, thank you, Ashu. Uh, then there is another question to uh, Mr. Asuk. Uh, 
another question the whether these oil skimmers or booms are effect uh, can be used as a permanent solution for the oil pollution uh actually there's a saying that prevention is better than cure so uh, if you can prevent such accidents that's the best ever solution that we can uh, make but uh, when it comes to uh, an accident now placing oil boom or a, a skimmer uh, permanently is not a solution because number one those uh, uh, technology or the equipment are very expensive and uh, the numbers are limited so uh, that is uh, not a permanent solution but uh, this has been used all over the world uh, especially uh, uh, in the in the countries where the nil uh, silk road uh, and um, uh, uh, i think uh, this is uh, what the majority of the countries practice uh, as at the moment so uh, it is not a good solution to uh, uh, place those uh, um, uh, devices in uh, vulnerable areas that is not that is not a, a solution but it is good to keep those uh, equipment ready with us uh, to act soon as possible whenever uh, an accident happen all right thank you ashok now i will come for a very burning question yeah uh, so it's a open question uh, whether there are people asking whether it's good to eat fish uh, how long this fishing industry will get affected and uh, and how long will this effects will last it's a open question to the all three resource persons so what is your view um my idea about the damage that has been caused is uh, very immense so uh, i'm not going to say that uh, i'm not going to come into a, a conclusion i'm not going to uh, mislead anyone but uh, our ecosystem that has been damaged uh, by this incident takes a long time to recover because these are large quantities of chemicals that have contaminated the ocean so uh, this will take like uh, even centuries to recover when i'm talking about uh, microplastic pollution but even the other chemicals that i uh, highlighted here like pcbs uh, will uh, uh remain for some time so we have to do continuous assessments to see uh what is the um uh most affected area and how long will it take to recover you know what i want to mention this as well the extent of uh, whatever uh the pollution happened Uh, and the damage uh, depend on the quantities uh, involving and the resulting concentration uh, in the water column as well both uh, uh, along the coast i mean uh, uh, and uh, down to the ocean bed so uh, and the length of time that any uh, category of biota Uh, has exposed to that concentration must be clearly assessed uh, before uh, uh, talking about a time of recovery and the sensitivity of a, of uh, an organism or organisms uh, to these chemicals must be considered uh, something very important to consider is that not only uh, different species uh, shows different uh, tolerance levels but also the tolerance of a given species uh, that can vary according to the stage of the organism's life cycle and the season 
that the pollution uh, has occurred so we have to consider all these factors and then only we can give a clear idea of when uh, this uh, harmful effect is going to be removed from the ocean environment so that's my idea enrique do you have any idea about the edibility of seafood what what would uh, be the long term yes. effect yeah yes uh, well i have I have many questions, uh, uh, and uh, I can speculate. Of course, one of my main concerns would be the lead. Lead depends on lead uh, reaction with water depends on heat, depends on uh, the uh, the uh, pH of the water. Yes. And uh, and those conditions we have in this shipwreck. So we have to be very concerned with the lead. Uh, and I'm not sure how much lead it fell. Uh, I, I get the impression it was eight tons. That's only the lead could cause a lot of pollution in the ocean. And it would possibly, uh, could possibly be found in uh, plants that and, and even in the water that uh, the fish uh, use. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, in the future we find lead in fish. And of course, when people eat a lot of fish, they start to bioaccumulate. So I have a question for the experts, whether we could try to remove the lead from the bottom of the ocean in order to minimize the contamination. I think that uh, that could be that may be possible, especially with uh, international help, uh, considering this is an international disaster. But uh, of course, uh, when you have uh, 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 an acute uh, pollution like that with oil, with microplastics, uh, you you also have long term effects, which are very di difficult to estimate. Uh, planetary health uh, uh, challenges us to see uh, uh, long-term effects. For instance, uh, one of the experts here mentioned uh, uh, mental health uh, effects. So even if we don't have pollution in fish, we can talk about uh, symbolic pollution. So will people uh, eat fish? Uh, with uh, with the same uh, pleasure, with the same trust after such a disaster, isn't that one kind of pollution that we should consider? So, what kind of communication, uh, what kind of scientific uh, surveillance, uh, uh, what kind of uh, work should uh, doctors and scientists do to assure the people that they can eat fish? Because if I had such a disaster. Uh, in my ocean, I'd be very wary, even if the scientists say it's not polluted and it's not harmful, I would, I would be very concerned. So uh, is that a kind of pollution, symbolic pollution? That could even be the worst kind of pollution if we open our mindsets. So I think that's relevant. Thank you, Professor Sewandi. Uh, do you have any idea? whether the lead could be removed from the ocean? Um, Sanka, I want to add something to what Enrique said, because uh, I totally agree with what Enrique said and also what uh, Ashoka said. Here, the problem is there are a few things that we need to, I would say, line up. Number one is to get in the, the real stock assessment of what was in the ship by going through the manifest very carefully, and also in what forms, even the lead, was it in the form of ingots is something that we really need to look at first, because that decides whether we can collect it from the uh, ocean uh, sort of uh, flow or not. And uh, that will also give us an idea how, what is the potential of it being uh, sort of uh, taken this way and that way by the currents. But, while those decisions are taken, I think what we really need to do now is look beyond Sri Lanka and look for disasters that involve 
heavy metals, plastics, so on and so forth. Yeah. Let's go to the, uh, the past uh, situations like what happened in uh, Japan with the uh, nuclear plant disaster, uh, even beyond that with Minamata disaster, uh, and see how, what are the type of guidelines that was given for fishing, consumption of fish, there are a lot we can learn until research is in line, until research confirms whether there's biomagnification and bioaccumulation of these things. Heavy metals are one side, but here we have a new, new concern. That's all to do with these nurdles. Um, there are possible breakdown into microplastics, yeah. so on and so forth. But leaving that aside, we can look at what's already, what has already happened. What were the guidelines that were used to ensure that people are given the right kind of information, their minds are set at ease. And then accordingly, very importantly, that we compensate those who are affected. Every time we decide to not to buy fish, a household is going to be deprived of their income. But if we can potentially work out, as Enrique said, like perhaps we don't know yet, but let's say assuming, let's say just a, an assumption, next two or three months, maybe until all the investigations are done and by institutions like NARA, when they come up with solid facts, that we take the decision, then what is our way, way forward? What's our road plan? So that both the mental health, the social well-being, and economic well-being is taken care of while we work on what we have to do. So I boil it down to use of science, both inside the country, outside the country, and communication. Here, it's not just the job of one institution. We all need to get together. That's uh, that's what I want to say. Right, thank you. The holistic picture should be considered always. Thank you very much for that answer. I have a question for you. This was actually, I think I sent that uh, article also to you. One of the academics uh, had posted uh, something and that, has, that is being circulated in the social media about this disaster. Uh, he's suggesting there would be uh, only short term effects of this, not long term effects, because uh, this, this happened in ocean and that would be uh, compared to the, the oceanic, the, the, the waters and all, this would be uh, there would be only effects except for certain things he had been talking about. Professor Wandi. Well, I will never jump into conclusions, uh, Sankar. Number one, I wonder whether uh, whoever that has posted it in social media, whether the person has done it with uh, sort of like with, whether with the person has done it with social responsibility. Because the thing is, I don't know whether he has seen the manifest itself to get a full account of the quantities, the forms and everything. Ocean itself is a closed environment. Our planet itself is a closed environment. Everything is circulating. We just can't say that the currents can take away the problem from X to Y because Y is going to be affected then. Therefore, I think one very important thing from here is we must wait until the good science tells us how to speak and what to speak. Uh, therefore, I, 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 I would say we must, as educated people, should not make comments like that um, because they can be very dangerous. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And one question, uh, probably one last question to uh, Ashok. Uh, uh, one of our um, uh, members have asked, uh, what measures did you take to assess the emitted PCB, POP, 
dark scenes from the burn ship do you have any idea no i didn't uh, show the results from uh, the current uh, uh, incident this was uh, something we have done uh, uh, earlier so uh, i think that the our team is working on that so uh, i cannot give an exact idea on uh, uh, what has been done uh, here uh, what was the question what measures did you take yes uh, whether we have calculated and we have measured the the the, the those things whether yes, we have taken uh, steps measures I, I think no, no, no. The the the, the, the analysis is uh, in progress at the moment, so uh, we will be able to uh, uh, give some kind of results. The problem is that uh, these kind of uh, uh, things cannot be uh, uh, done wholly. I mean, totally uh, uh, with the uh, existing technology we have. So we need advanced technology. Some of the uh, previous analysis uh, has been uh, done by taking samples to uh, our uh, partnering uh, uh, countries uh, in several projects. So that is how we used to uh, 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 analyze samples for uh, these like uh, uh, chemicals because uh, PCBs, POPs, and dioxins are very, uh, uh, hard to uh, analyze, you know, so we need uh, accurate results. So we need that kind of involvement as soon as possible. So we will be working on that. I was talking about a previous uh, uh, experiment that we have conducted. So uh, on this uh, uh, incident, we will be working on that uh, at, at our earlier. It is a very interesting discussion, uh, though the time is flying. So, uh, Sajid, do you have any other questions we can ask briefly? Sajid? Yeah, sorry, sorry. I was talking by uh, without me, um, unmuting. Right. Uh, thank you, Sankar. Uh, so, uh, there is another burning question coming out. Will this affect, this disaster will affect our salt production because the authorities have told uh, they have stocks until up to two years but uh, at any point at any given uh, point of time will these chemicals get mixed with these our salt and will it affect our uh, salt production it's an open question um, Sajit, is Sajit I think yeah. uh, uh, you know most of our saltans are uh, either of uh, Putlam area or uh, down south in uh, Hambantot area. At the moment, I know that uh, NARA and many other agencies are uh, sort of like following the uh, path of Fernerdles. Uh, in addition to that, I think uh, there, there will also be studies about the path of uh, other sort of uh, chemicals that we know that are there in the uh, uh, ship. But Again, the, 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 the situation is, as uh, I think Ashok mentioned, we really don't have information at the moment to talk about it, but I'm very sure we have enough stocks of salt. And also I'm very sure uh, the responsible government authorities can come forward and men clarify this situation. That's why in my presentation also, I mentioned that this communication is going to matter a lot. Uh, yeah. And I urge all the government agencies to come forward and uh, provide these answers because a general public depends on educated, calculated evidence for them to take decisions. That fear, unless taken off, is the greatest mental fear. And that is not something that our people should live with. Yeah, thank you. And also there is another question saying uh, whether, this, uh, whether there's a possibility for these toxic chemicals to travel upwards through the rivers. We have to check that also because uh, there's a possibility uh, based on the uh, tides, tide levels, uh, these chemicals can be uh, uh, contaminate the uh, river mouths and can go upwards sometimes. 
uh, during a low tide. So uh, it is it is always good to take precautions uh, if any person is closer to a river mouth. So just uh, actually we have to work on that those things. So again, we cannot uh, jump into conclusions, but but some kind of uh, action or a framework is needed uh, at the earliest possible. So uh, I'm saying yes, there's kind of a possibility that these uh, heavy metals or chemicals can uh, contaminate uh, freshwater systems and the lagoons. So uh, we have to be uh, cautious uh, uh, and uh, we have to alert on that. Right, thank you. Uh, Ashok, what about uh, this canned fish and dry fish industry? How this disaster will affect that industry as well? In case of uh, dry fish, things rely on uh, salt again. And uh, things will affect uh, that industry as well. So usually, NARA does some uh, kind of assessment for uh, uh, toxic chemicals. Uh, there are uh, essential uh, analysis uh, that is uh, going on at NARA uh, regularly uh, in, the, in the Department of uh, uh, Post Harvest Technology. There's a special division for that. So they are checking the quality of uh, uh, those things uh, regularly. So uh, in that way, we have to uh, keep uh, checking the quality standards. Some, but uh, same as the fish production, uh, we have to uh, carefully look into dry fish production and canned fish production because we know that uh, when it, there at times uh, some incidents have been recorded that uh, fish. Uh, or the um, nearly expired fish have, uh, have been used in dry fish production. Uh, and we ha some had problems, uh, we had problems uh, uh, on the quality of dry fish. There are, uh, so these things uh, has to be addressed. Right, one last question from me. Uh, what is the authority and what are the institutes that are checking the chemical quality of the salt in Sri Lanka? Well, Sankha, when it comes to uh, the standards of any product in this country, Sri Lanka Standard Institute is supposed to play the role. I think in a situation like this, uh, they have a role to play um, to ensure that the correct standards are maintained. I think uh, coupled with that, institutes like NARA and um, uh, ITI, these are the government agencies that can actually look into mm -hmm. the chemical composition of these the things in the wake of a situation like that yeah. and uh, give directives. Asoka, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, no, that's very clear. Uh, Professor Sevandi, and uh, in addition to that, uh, I think the Central Environment Authority is doing a great job on that. And uh, my suggestion is that we have to come uh, uh, to a common platform that we can suggest our findings. So now, what I mean is an individual person cannot uh, post a decision or influence on making decisions. So what we are talking in different platforms, in different webinars, in different kind of uh, conferences, meetings, those things uh, must uh, go to the governmental level, ministry level, and uh, with the facts, uh, with the proofs, uh, with our laboratory experiments and uh, uh, surveys. And there are other things to be assessed as well, because. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have a need to assess the uh, livelihood or, or the cost of 
lost livelihood of fishermen. They are uh, um, the indirect fishery workers, those who help the fishing industry. So those socioeconomic assessments also uh, have to be uh, streamlined uh, uh, in order to uh, come into a good uh, uh, conclusion or to support uh, uh, clever decision making in this regard. So that is my uh, final uh, uh, waypoint. Thank you. Right. Uh, do you all have any questions? So if you all have any questions, you all can just unmute and uh, directly ask your questions from the eminent panel. Right. Uh, thank you. So in the absence of any questions, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Asok Veerakon from NARA, Professor Sevand Jayakodi uh, from Waimba University, and Professor Enrique Barros uh, from uh, Wonka. Uh, thank you very much for your kind participation. We learned a lot, and it was very valu very valuable piece of information that you all gave us. And we hope that you all will work with us, with Sri Lanka Medical Association, for the future work as well. And thank you very much. Uh, and we will be posting this video in a uh, few days' time in YouTube. So if anybody has missed it, I uh, can go through it again uh, and use this as a reference material also. So thank you very much again, uh, Mr. Asok Virakon, uh, Professor Seva Jayakodi, and uh, Professor Enrique Barros. Thank you very much. So we are going to conclude the session today. Thank you very much and good night. Good night.